legalizefreedom.com. Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Listen without limits. Unchain your brain. Change your thinking. Change your life. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is Bernard Beitman who joins us to discuss his book Meaningful Coincidences, How and Why Synchronicity and Serendipity Happen. Each of us has more to do with creating coincidences than we think. In this broad exploration of the potential of coincidences to expand our understanding of reality, psychiatrist Bernard Beitman explores why and how coincidences, synchronicity and serendipity happen, and how to use these common occurrences to inspire psychological, interpersonal and spiritual growth. Through a complete catalogue of coincidence patterns with numerous examples, Beitman clarifies the relationship between synchronicity and serendipity and dissects the anatomy of a coincidence. He defines coincidence types through their two fundamental constituents, mental events and physical events. He analyzes the many uses of meaningful coincidences as well as their potential problems. He explains how you will see patterns guiding your life decisions and learn to expect that coincidences are more likely to occur during times of stress, high emotion and strong need, which helps you be ready to use them when they occur. Exploring the crucial role of individual thought and action in synchronicities and serendipities, Beitman shows that there's much more behind these occurrences than fate or randomness. Hello and welcome Bernard and thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. It's great to be here with you, Greg. It's great to be here with you. Well, today, Bernard, we're going to be discussing your new book that's entitled Meaningful Coincidences, How and Why Synchronicity and Serendipity Happen. Uh, before we dive into that, if you could just give listeners a little bit, bit of information about your background and your work in general. I'm a psychiatrist uh, in private practice in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, I was chairman of a psychiatry department at the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri, uh, and I studied chest pain and panic disorder as well as tried to develop uh, and successfully developed a psychotherapy training program that was used in more than half the psychiatric residency programs in the United States. So I have some, a research background in the body and in the mind, and before that, I went to um, Yale Medical School and um, did my psychiatric residency at Stanford. Now, people, whether they've read your book or not, but particularly for those who haven't, they see the word synchronicity and serendipity in the title, also the word coincidence. And for many people, certainly the ones that I discuss these matters with lay people, it's like the, it's just a coincidence phrase comes up a lot of the time. And of course, you break this down in your book, meaning in these things and how we mistake them, some of these uh, occurrences as meaningful. So perhaps you could start by telling us wh where your interest in this area began, why you thought this was something meaningful to pursue, and then from there just start to talk a little bit about where coincidences, synchronicity, serendipity, where these things overlap and where they don't, because there's kind of a sort of Venn diagram, it seems to me, and where you would place um, events. Exactly. It, it is a Venn diagram, and that's why I try to break the Venn diagram apart in a later chapter and try to say what a meaningful coincidence is made of, which is mind and object. But we'll get to that. Uh, you asked me how I got involved with this. Well, it got involved with me is the best way I can say it. Now, being uh, Spending a life studying any subject usually starts with personal experience. And I began as a as a child and a young adult, uh, feeling as if my dog and I had entered a tunnel, uh, 
a tunnel that other people may not have ever seen and or I didn't know about it and uh, that tunnel led us to uh, a magical forest uh, and that magical forest was filled with strange plants and animals and uh, beautiful and made lots of sound. This is all a fantasy way I'm telling you about this, but it was the experience of of a boy and a a young man. Uh, And in that forest, I also saw lots of meaningful coincidences. And that forest was really my life. And uh, I was living kind of in a magical way in experiencing meaningful coincidences. And the first one I ever had, that I can remember anyway, uh, involved my dog, Snapper. Uh, and that started me on the pathway that has led me to uh, our discussion here, Greg. Uh, I'd like to tell you the story of Snapper and me and how we got into this, if that's all right. Please, yeah, go ahead. I came home one day, uh, I was eight or nine, in Shaker Heights, Ohio, outside of Cleveland, Ohio, and usually uh, Snapper was in the front yard and uh, hanging around and usually waiting for me, and he wasn't there. And I asked my mother, who was standing in the doorway of the house, uh, where's Snapper? And she said, why don't you go to the police station and ask them? Now, years later, I've wondered, how come my mother came up with that? But I'll never know. I uh, always can speculate. So I got back on my bike and rode down Kinsman, the name of the street, to my elementary school where I had just come from. Because right across the big, big road uh, was the police station. I knew it was over there, but I didn't ever go over there. I never crossed the big road before. But then I went over to the big crosswalk and walked my bike across and then rode down to the foot of the stairs of the police station and walked up some stairs and then I parked my bike and walked up some more stairs and got to this big door. It was a big door and somehow I got it open and walked in and there was this big desk with this big man sitting behind the desk so I looked up at him I looked up at him and he looked down at me and I said have you seen my dog and he said sorry son uh, haven't seen your dog and I started crying as I am right now and walked back down the stairs and got on my bike and instead of crossing the big road the way I'd come I just started pedaling I went to the right I was tears were filled filling my eyes I I was so lost without snapper he he and I were such a good friends my best friend really and uh, later uh, in Wilmington Delaware we would go out in the woods and catch uh he would find uh uh t- turtles that were run- w- burrowing around in the forest and that's <laughs> why so i knew he found one and we'd bring him back home but that wasn't happening then uh snapper and i snapper was gone to me he wasn't there he was i i was crying where where is he and then i saw through my tears a dog walking toward me that had the kind of sideways funny walk that Snapper had. Uh, two legs weren't back, his back legs weren't quite in back, of it, in back of his front legs. They're off to the side. And he says, that's Snapper? And we got closer and it was Snapper and it was Snapper. And I was so happy to see him. And he jumped up on my leg and as if to say, where have you been? And, uh, I said, okay, let's go home. We went home. My parents never asked me how I found him or how he found me. But that was the beginning of what I now call human GPS or inner GPS, uh, the ability to get where we need to go without knowing how we got there. We have in us uh, an internal guiding system that gets us without our rational mind working where we need to be. And I read a chapter in the 
in my book, Meaningful Coincidences, uh, that just came out a couple of weeks ago on this human GPS capacity that we all probably have. And in a way, it, ref it reflects uh, a basic idea about the relationship between technology and the human mind, that sometimes technologies reflect what the human mind is capable of. But that's part of another story. That's how I got started, Greg. That was my first one. But I didn't really, it, that didn't do, oh, well, I'm going to look at synchronicity, right? No, that didn't do that. I just remembered that story because it was so important in my life. And many years later, when I was um, at age 31 in San Francisco, um, I was living in a Victorian house in the Fillmore District, and it was 11 it was 11 p.m. San Francisco time, and I was standing over the, the sink in our kitchen, and I had a, something in my throat, or I thought I did, and I couldn't get it out. I was choking and choking and choking and choking, and, ch and then I finally got it out. Well, I went to sleep, and the next morning, um, my brother called me to say our father had died, and he died at uh, 2 a.m., Wilmington, Delaware time, which was the same time as 11 p.m. San Francisco time, 3,000 miles difference in the United States. And he had died of choking on his own blood. He bled into his throat. My father bled into his throat. He was, so he was, he was recovering from um, a pretty difficult illness, but he had been recovering and that he choked on his own blood was, and died this way was a big surprise in both ways that he died suddenly and that he died while at this around the same time I also was choking. So that taught me that it's possible for two people who are closely connected to each other emotionally might experience the pain of one of them at a distance from the other one. And I did some research myself and looked at other research. And yes, this is not an uncommon experience. People feel the pain, the distress of a loved one at a distance. And those two experiences got me started writing this book. So the inscription in the book is for Carl Beitman, my father, and Snapper, my dog. Well, what you're saying there about connection between two people who are close, who have an emotional bond, obviously you have that with parents and children, or indeed all the other family members um, who are close and spend most of their, if not all their lives together. You have that with twins in a way as well. And that's a special kind of bond we know about. I'd, I've never actually looked to see if, if the bond you have in twins extends to triplets and beyond. I'm assuming it would be, or uh, would rather. But it's also interesting that when people who are not previously connected, well, not in a, a <coughs> not in a five sense 3D reality sort of way, you know, for example, two people who come together in a close relationship, a loving relationship, and then maybe that bond grows over time, that they become, they can be develop those connections. It's almost like quantum particles, you know, and, and entanglement. You know, the two particles are introduced to each other, and from then on, no matter how far apart they are, there's a connection. The quantum particle uh, explanation or metaphor is very popular, uh, and it, it's a little bit like Jung's use of the word synchronicity as an a-causal connecting principle. The quantum particles is a good placeholder for something that I think we yet don't understand, because pa quantum particles are a lot teenier than us human beings and our emotions, but the metaphor seems apt, and there may be some ways to uh, make that metaphor uh, more realistic, but I have other ideas about how that might happen. Well, I suppose, it, as you say, it is it's popular and it's an obvious uh, comparison to draw, I think, especially with, um, and I know there's a lot of, um, a lot written and published in the realm of, of pop science and quantum physics. It's actually quite misleading or com completely misleading and misrepresents what uh, quantum physics is revealing. But if you look at the, one of the fundamental understandings that um, at root, Everything is, is you and I and the, the, whatever you're sitting on, whatever, you know, you're, all of the material things around us at root are of the same stuff and that there is a, this universal matrix of connection at, at a deep level. Then I suppose you could see how that, that uh, comparison would be made. Yeah, it's, it's there to be made. 
and uh, I, I'm glad for it. I embrace it because it emphasizes the potential reality of what we are, uh, of what we are living in, and which coincidences like this help uh, elucidate. So yes, I agree with you. When I first read your uh, human GPS, I love that phrase, and it really, really, it's um, the, the best one I've heard. That kind of says, tries to, you know, in a in, in a couple of words, what it is that you're trying to get across with the concept or concepts behind it. And the first thing I thought of was, and I know this is like it was just a mental leap, but I thought of all the automatic actions and and processes that we go through that once learned we don't have to think about anymore, like riding a bike, driving a car or riding your bike or driving your car to, from one familiar destination to another, seemingly without having to engage in much conscious thought. And But the, the reason I thought of that in, at the same time as uh, reading about your human GPS idea was that it was the idea of background processes running all the time that we're not aware of and whether uh, this is something that if we become more conscious of that we can, we can perhaps develop. Uh, I think you're right. I think we can practice the, this human GPS, or I like internal GPS uh, even better uh, because it, animals also have this capacity uh, to be able to get where they need to get to. Dogs that uh, find their their uh, owners uh, by, and travel many many miles to get there, and cats can do it, and I'm sure animals out in the in the wild do it as well. So we'll be interchangeable about human and inner. And the person who came up with the word inner just confirmed that what we're talking about, she came up with it from a different perspective, that we do have this capacity. And I strongly believe that we can practice it and we can make it better so that we can let ourselves go, which means not have our rational mind working all the time to try to figure out what to do next, but allow this human GPS, this inner GPS, to decide what we're going to do and where we're going to do it. I think that it's part of the resistance, whether it's from scientific establishment or just from Joe Blow in the street to some of these ideas of non-material forces at work. Um, even though everyone to a greater or lesser extent experiences these and, and we, we have these sort of experiences more, I think, than most of us are aware of, you know, because we're not necessarily paying attention. We, they get, uh, they fly under the radar because we're not used to paying attention. We dismiss them and we don't talk to each other about them very much. You know, it's almost like a bit of a, a taboo. But this, the materialist reductionist paradigm that we're kind of laboring under at the minute, despite a hundred plus years of, of quantum physics showing us that it's not, everything's not as it appears to be on the surface, we have this either or mentality, whereas reality is a bit more like an and also. Um, it's not just black and white. So there's that, just that strange clash there between people's lived experience, but how they're, how they grew up thinking reality works. So you can, you can, you can deny your own actual experience of your own, even your five senses, but your, your inner experience, you can deny that. However, it's like when I was young, the adults would tell me not to worry about having a nightmare because dreams weren't real. That's where I started to question it. Cause I, what, what do you mean? It's not real. I mean, I had an experience. I mean, that, that, that happened. So a question of how it happened, where it happened, uh, what the nature of it was is another matter, but it certainly happened. You're singing my song, Greg. <laughs> well, I mean, perhaps we should, um, for, for many people who are new to all this, maybe we could say a little bit more about, in terms of the book, what you, how you explain the difference between an overlap with coincidence, synchronicity, serendipity, whichever way you wish to explore these terms. I mean, because something like coincidence, we have a coincidence. We have two incidents, same time. Synchronicity presumably has cron in there, is Kronos time. Maybe just talk up in, in terms so that people can maybe start to think about these things in terms of their own experience and say, okay, well, that thing that some, a listener might have said, oh, that was just a coincidence. They might start thinking about it as potentially something they could look at from a more meaningful angle. Well, that's, that's what we're doing here is trying to increase the likelihood that people will notice coincidences and that they will tell other people about them. That's part of my job here in this reality is to increase coincidence sensitivity, and you're helping us do that, and to tell coincidence stories. And I hope you'll tell me one of yours. I've just told you a couple of mine. And I want to comment on the on the idea of 
black and white uh, that people tend to live with. It's an either or thing. One of the things that coincidence awareness does, it makes you have to think both in terms of polarity and continuum, that there is black and white, but also gray. And the gray comes in various shades of gray. And coincidences start showing that to be the case when a basic element of a coincidence, of the basic element of lots of coincidences are a similarity between a, th a mind event, a thought, an image, and an objective event in that somebody else can see. So mind and object are two the two most common elements that create a coincidence. So when you have a thought, an image, like the most common one is probably thinking of someone you haven't heard from, uh, from in a long time, and that person contacts you, that's your thought, and then anybody else can see that that person has contacted you. That begins to break down the boundaries of your mind, that your mind seems to be connected to your environment in ways you don't really understand yet. And that's what coincidences are doing to the black and white thinking of current reality. It's worth always keeping in mind there are such, such things as death and taxes, which appear to be black and white things, but they're not necessarily the case either. Who knows? We may not just die, but our bodies die, and that's pretty clear. But there may be something else going on, which a lot of evidence is coming around to suggest may, might be the case. Black and white and gray are ideas that coincidence exercises people's minds with. So coming to what we're talking about, oh, that's just a coincidence. Well, I use the word coincidence uh, deliberately. Because it isn't a mere coincidence or a meaningful coincidence, it's a coincidence. A coincidence is a coming together of two apparently unrelated events in a way that suggests a possible explanation that may also be surprising and unexpected. It's the two events coming together that that is unexpected, seems to be a low probability, that make a coincidence. So I listen to people, and for the adjectives they use in front of the word coincidence, for those who say just a coincidence, their view of reality is everything is random. You can go from just to that person thinks everything's random. All the events are random. It's all probability. It's all chance. <laughs> There is, there is probability, and that's a key part of all this, but it's all chance. And chance is, <laughs> chance is taking a chance on chance, so I can play with the words, but random is the word just usually uh, is connected with. On the other end of that is meaningful, and meaningful means there's something to it, and meaningful has two different definitions uh, related to meaningful coincidence. One is, what does it mean to you, Greg? that this coincidence happened? What does it mean to you, people listening to us? What does it mean to you personally? Is this a job opportunity? Is this a new relationship possibility? Is this a way of getting some psychological or spiritual developmental help? So how is it helpful to me? Then there's the question of meaning that has to do with, hey, what's, what's the probability of this? What are the odds? In other words, how does it, how can I explain this meaningful coincidence? What are the ranges of, of explanations? And they go from random, because some of them are random, to God on the other end, or mystical, or universe, or the greater consciousness, or some things that we can't really define because they are beyond our ability to know, only to believe in. And there is mystery in a lot of coincidences, but in between, which a lot of people don't like to recognize, is our own personal agency. Each of us has something to do with making coincidences happen, some a little less, some a little more. If I hadn't been crying and taken the wrong turn, it wouldn't have happened. I had something to do with it, 
I had something to do with finding my dog. I was out there running around looking for him. So we have something to contribute to coincidences. That's meaningful. Now, let's define what you ask about the, the two key words in the title of my book, in addition to meaningful coincidence, synchronicity and serendipity. Well, synchronicity uh, is a younger term than serendipity. Uh, a lot of people don't know that. Uh, serendipity was uh, first invented by a, a, a British legislature, leg, legislator uh, named Walpole, who was also a big collector of of lots of things and especially books but paintings and stuff and he liked to be able to find stuff that he needed and when he he found that he was able to just like find something without knowing how he got it he just run across it and this was wall pony poliani he called it he was proud of himself in his ability to call to be able to find what he needed now these are called within the researchers of serendipity these are called uh, super encounterers people who can find stuff that they're looking for but in kind of strange ways and so serendipity now has come to mean accidental discoveries or happy accidents that people find what they're what they're looking for in strange ways or they find something that they weren't didn't know they were looking for, but they can really use. These happy accidents depend on on being wise enough. Sagacity was the term Walpole used. You have to have some ability to recognize it, and you have to also have some ability to see how it might be useful. And the prime the prime example of serendipity is the discovery of penicillin by Alexander Fleming, who accidentally found uh, a penicillin mold growing in Petri dishes in his laboratory sink when he came back from vacation in uh, 1928. He didn't clean the Petri dishes when he went on vacation, and that was his uh, Scottish way of taking care of things. He just wanted to see what happened, and he found what he was looking for in a way that he hadn't expected because he was looking for an antibiotic. On these Petri dishes were bacteria, and this golden fuzz was penicillin mold that was putting out a juice that killed these bacteria, and he could recognize this halo of inhibition in the middle of where that penicillin mold was because he'd seen that same inhibition in 1921 when he had nasal drippings falling on similar petri dishes with uh, the bacteria in them so he he had the sagacity he had the drive and he could recognize this accidental discovery so serendipity is very much about accidents of many medical Discoveries, especially in pharmacology, have been like, hey, how did that happen? I mean, uh, you, people stumble across things while they're doing something else, and that's how Viagra got found. They were doing an hyper antihypertensive drug, and the guys who were in the research project didn't want to have them take the their drug away because they liked it. And they asked why, and they said because of what it, how it helped them sexually. That was another accident. Things are discovered by accident, much more often than Nobel Prize winnings, winners uh, are said to have done. But if you ask them, well, Nobel Prize winners, many of them will tell you, well, they just kind of stumbled into this one. I was looking around, but this thing happened, and there it was. I could recognize it. So that's serendipity. Well, there's a, an interesting dimension of serendipity in that it, you're talking about finding something that you're looking for, but there's also finding something that you didn't know you were looking for. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it does... For example, things that people get emotional about, things that are meaningful to them in some way already, like personal relationships, um, or, you know, or jobs or anything that any of the big things, you know, in life, things that they get emotional about, they'll tend to be more ready to talk about in these terms. And there's, you know, I'm sure there's a reason for that. So, so there's a, a lady's pulled over at the side of the road. Uh, this is going to sound a bit, um, dated in terms of my characterization, but I'm just thinking of in terms of like a romantic film. Lady's pulled over at the side of the road, got a blown out tire. She hasn't got a spare. Terrible night, thunderstorm, pouring with rain, dark. Guy comes along, pulls over, 
able to help her out, send her on their way, love blossoms, they found the love of their lives that way. Is, is that like a serendipity? Something that's just, that maybe they didn't know they were looking for anything, but they found something. Oh, yeah. Good example. So you're asking about my own experience. Well, I haven't got um, a couple of examples of a powerful synchronicity or coincidence. Um, I do pay attention to these things. I started quite early on. What In my life, the first thing that got me thinking about the nature of reality was actually what we would class as deja vu or deja vécu experiences. And maybe all the things I classed or do class as deja vu wouldn't necessarily fall into that categorization. But those are the things that got me thinking because it didn't, even if I, for the most part, couldn't see any meaning or rhyme or reason behind what had happened, the, the experience was so powerful that it stopped me in my tracks and I felt like I was outside of time, even just for a few seconds. It's just like, whoa. And whether it felt meaningful or not, I, I found that I really enjoyed those experiences, even if they were sometimes like really, really startling. I remember the first times it happened when I was a child. I wasn't giggling with laughter, but I just stopped and I thought about those experiences for a long time afterwards. As for them being useful, I don't think I've ever found a deja vu experience useful, but that wasn't the point. It was just, to me anyway, it was indicating something. That's why I said to you off air that I felt I was being pointed towards something. So deja vu was the thing, and it's still the thing that happens to me most often. A couple of other experiences that did say... Wait, 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 wait no, a second. Wait, wait. Go, go ahead. What do, you, what do you mean by deja vu? Experience uh, usually involves a combination of place and sensory experience. Sight, sound, smell, touch, usually sound, smell, just a, a feeling. So it's a combination of it's an, like an, a, a multi-sensory experience of having been somewhere before or having experienced something before in similar circumstances. I had a very powerful one recently, um, a few weeks ago. And again, it didn't point to anything other than it was just reminding me, you know, that, you know, that stuff that you spend so much time thinking about and studying. It's real. And I was like, I know it's real. I just, <laughs> I was reminded again, I, I found that the more you pay attention to these things, the more you notice them. Whether they're occurring more often, I'm not sure, but you certainly notice them more often. The more you look, the more you see. That concludes part one of our interview. Part two will be available soon in the subscribers area at legalizefreedom.com. Legalizefreedom.com. <laughs>